Hallelujah. Thank you. Welcome, welcome, welcome. What a sweet time we've already had together. Um, just praising the Lord, basking in his presence. He, we truly, truly, truly um, enjoy the presence of the Lord with each other. We find the truth. We know the truth. We be the truth. We are the truth. When we allow him to work through us, it's, it's a sweet place to be. Not many can call call on him in that way. And I'm just thankful at Global Truth Ministry that we constantly, constantly um, search after him and his truth in us. I want to wish all the mothers um, today, happy Mother's Day. I know me being a mother, I'm very blessed by the fact that, um, that, that, that God has used me in that way. Um, for my own children, but for other children as well. And it's just an honor that um, he, he has blessed me beyond belief. Um, this morning, I'm going to be talking about a subject that are very dear to parents' hearts, but um, particularly mothers, and that's commitment, commitment to their children, their children commitment to them and really understanding what that means and how we move forward um, in that presence. I'm not going to use Mother's Day to do that. I'm going to use God's commitment to us and how we respond to his commitment to us to really try to drive that home today. Um, commitment is a familiar word and we we know that in many, many ways, we are always um, um, believing that we're committed to the things that we do. We want to be committed to the things we do. So today we're gathered to reflect on the profound essence of the commitment of God in our lives and how we should be committed to God. Sometimes we, I know, I think, oh God, there's no one else, there's nothing else, et cetera, et cetera, I would rather do. I'm totally sold out. I'm totally this to you, God. And then something comes along and he shows me a part of my heart. And I'm like, yeah, that part needs a little more commitment in it. And it is not a bad thing because God is just so... I don't know. He's just so awesome and so gentle and so generous to us. And these fundamental things about committing to him and what he he has provided for us and, and knowing that that's the essence of what will succeed ultimately in life is something important. It's something we think about every now and then. It's something that we know, so we sort of take it for granted. But Often, often we don't really understand the depth and the deepness of, of our commitment, um, God's commitment to us and what our commitment to be should be to him. Last week we heard about the Hebrew people, you know, in the desert and, and them having to walk across the Jordan and their commitment to walk across the Jordan and to leave someplace was unprofitable, but it was familiar. You know, when we get in a familiar place, it is hard for us to change to the commitment that God has provided for us to proceed, to, to go ahead of, go ahead and do that which is we are called to do. So they needed this newness and they wanted this newness and the land that they were in had pretty much served its purpose. So it had become more and more unfunctional and God is bringing them across the Jordan again for the second time as, as Pastor Leroy mentioned last week and they needed to get in the water in order to receive the promise, the commitment that he had made to them. But commitment requires us sometimes to get unstuck. It requires us to change. It requires us to move. It requires us to lay down whatever we're carrying, whether it be a burden or a familiar spirit or uh, uh, something that we've cuddled onto and attached ourselves to. 
Our commitment to God requires us to continually change and let that commitment be birthed in us. The commitment is a cornerstone upon which we build our relationship, we pursue our goals, and we walk the path of faith. You cannot do these things if you don't commit your heart in your mind and your well-being to do it. It's a pledge, it's a promise, it's a it's a dedication of our, our our of ourselves, our character, and it helps us in our journey. It defines our journey, our commitment. We are going to look at two scriptures today, one from Solomon, who was the wisest man ever, and David, who had the heart of God, who who loved God beyond his own imagination. And we're going to look at how God's commitment um, had, was illustrated in these two scriptures that we're going to look at today. We're going to look at um, Proverbs 16, 3, and we're also going to look at um, Psalms 37, 5. So also we will, we will see how God's commitment to us and how we respond to his commitment. So let us dig a little bit deeper of the virtue and discover the transformative power it holds. You know, from the beginning of the year, I've been talking about completing and allowing that transformative power to change us into who we really are, which we are made in the image of God. And if we are made in the image of God day by day, we should see that nature being transformed into his likeness more and more. So the kingdom being manifested in our well-being, in our presence, in our bodies, for the whole universe to see because that is who we are. We are the image and likeness of God. That's, you know, I don't know about you, but it, it's it's sometimes hard for me to look in the mirror and, and think that's the image of God reflecting back at me because I've been trained for many, many years, several decades to look in the mirror and see Rita. But more and more and more, I'm seeing the essence of who I really am, and that is the image and the likeness of God. So let's start by examining the meaning of the two scriptures. Um, the two, the, the, actually, I'm going to use a verse um, from each of the scripture. We're going to look at Proverbs 16, and it focuses on committing our works committing our works. And Psalms 37, 5, it, it focused on committing our way. And we we have to make a decision when we think of that, you know, why is she, there are two different scriptures, works, one talks about works and the other one talks about the way. Um, what does that, what point is that? Is it is there a difference in that? And my core message for us today is to ask two questions. What does it mean to commit your works? And how do you commit your ways to the Lord? And as we go through this, I hope you, you, you examine yourself in your commitment which may be very familiar to you now, your commitment to the Lord, but get that um, essence of, of newness that is in it, reaffirmation, if it's reaffirmation, change, if it's need of change, and an exaltation and an encouragement that you can go to a higher level in your commitment and who you are in Christ Jesus on a daily basis. So what can you expect for this message is an examination of your thoughts. How are you committed with your wor works and your ways to the Lord? I, I see them as being a, a slightly different, but we're gonna take a look and get some advice from Solomon. Um, as I said, he is known to be one of the wisest men on earth and see how he looked at Proverbs verse 
Proverbs 16, verse 3, and talked about commitment. You know, Sol Solomon, when he was talking about this, this chapter, one of the essence that he came upon was he focused on truth. Solomon was always, even in his quirky behavior, was looking for the truth. He wanted his mental thoughts to be the thoughts of God, and he wanted his physical um, presence of God in him to be manifested. We, we know he did a great job with his mental ascent on the knowledge and the wisdom of God because he was, he was um, noted for the wisdom. Solomon was noted for his good, great wisdom. We also know that his physical efforts sometimes failed him. Um, he had so many wives that he couldn't even live in any of their houses. He had to, one of the phrases is he had to live up on the roof because um, his behavior, even though he had all this knowledge and he had this wisdom, the manifestation of the commitment to what God wanted him to be and to do was something that he was he was still um seeking he which is always good that we're seeking he was all it was an area of training in the word of god that he needed to keep um going back to god and say or god came to him and said you don't have it yet you got to you have to you allow me and this is a really important um um point about our existence we tend to think we can work things out of us, or we tend to think that we can we can change what we have experientially and through experience and through indoctrination change in us. And I just want to purport to you this morning that even though you have the greatest intentions to change something in you, that may not be how the change comes about. How the change comes about is you surrendering that thing that can so easily beset you and allowing God through the Holy Spirit to work it inside of you that you even begin to see the manifestation of it on the outside. And clearly others may have seen it even before you saw it, but your efforts and your 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 power to change you is, is very, very, very limited, if not impossible, even with knowing that the Holy Spirit exists in you. It's one thing to know that the Holy Spirit dwells within you. It's another thing to let the Holy Spirit be the driver of your destination and your journey. So truth of your mental and physical, physical efforts are important that we surrender when we seek the knowledge of God and how things work and how they function and how these things come to pass, we can only do that in that sweet spot in the Holy Spirit, which we are truly, you've heard us say, that we are truly spirit beings living in a body. If we continue to try to use the tools of the body to to, to manifest the spirit, we have it backwards. We need to let the spirit manifest the change that would be reflected in our bodies because of our new nature. So we commit our works, our plans to God. We seek him, we let him work it out. And, you're, and he tells you, if you do it this way, you will succeed. So people, people, often want to succeed and they want to help God so they can succeed when they don't realize that mostly it's you taking your hands off of what the world has trained you in and allowing the Holy Spirit of truth 
to manifest itself. I, I hope to explain that. It's a hard concept to explain. I tried to explain it to Pastor Leroy. I tried to explain it to my, my daughter. And even at times, I would, in trying to explain it, have to pause because the idea of me doing nothing and letting the Holy Spirit do it through me, it's not really nothing. I am working hard not to interfere with that which has already been put in me. But I tell you, that's hard work. People often make a misstep. They don't, I, I hate to say fail, because God is always the God of restoration. So when we make a misstep or we make a mistake, he's always there to restore us. And I'll, I'll give you some examples of that in this teaching today. But people are able to rationalize almost any kind of behavior as they strive to justify themselves. I'm a good person. I like doing what, what God wants me to do. I, I go to church. I spend all night long with X, Y, Z praying. I did this. I did that. I, those are not bad things. Those are good works. And he tells us to do good works. But the transformation of commitment to allow him to change you into his likeness and image is different. It is different. So Solomon warns us. He gives us a warning of self-deception. We can easily deceive ourselves because we can get to a posture of thinking that we're good just because we do things that 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 are good natured. But we are good because he is good in us. We are holy because he is holy in us. We are righteous because it is his righteousness that is manifested through us. So the, the whole posture on where we come from, we are coming from our spirit nature and our bodies are reaping the benefit of the manifestation of our spirit man and not our, our, our bodies being the dominant character in how we go about our daily lives. Solomon words is warning us against self-deception as in Hebrew 14 4 13 points out God sees everything so you can't fool him you just need to allow the process that God has been in place to be 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 used he warns us in in first Corinthians um chapter 4 and verses 5 that don't judge yourself because you get into condemnation just because you can't do it it's not a thing. He, he, he said, I knew I was going to have to work this out through you by allowing my Holy Spirit to work in you. And he says, it's not a bad thing. So don't, don't get um, in a place where you feel God loves me and he trusts me and I can't do what he called me to do. I've read scripture time and time again that says, you write, you can't do what he, what he's called you to do, but he can do it for you and he can do it through you. That doesn't mean that you're idle. That doesn't mean that you're stagnant. That doesn't mean that you're inactive. It means that you are participating 100% and God being God in you. Yes, just like Jesus, you're 100% man. You have a human nature, but you also have the spirit of the living God. So you have to reconcile those two things in you and know that the spirit of the living God taking posture and its rightful place in you, because your body's temporal and it's going to pass away anyway, it brings forth the truth and the true nature of who you are in Christ Jesus. It tells us clearly in 1 Corinthians, don't judge yourself. Don't judge others. Let God be the judge because he knows what it looks like. He knows how he's made it and he knows how it should function. So therefore to the main focus in, he, in Proverbs 16, 3, we commit everything. We commit everything all of our plans, all of our works to the Lord. We don't think that our education or our experience of hard knocks have taught us 
so much that we don't need to go and submit those works to God. The best chance of success is to, when we come to a plan is to align it with truth. And I'm not saying we don't know the truth. We do know the truth because we know Jesus, but we don't know how all of the truth unfolds because we haven't gone through some of the the areas of truth that is still being worked in us. So that means we have to submit to God who knows who is the truth and the light and seek him so we're in a better position to have those, those areas of, of not knowing or darkness be be shown the light and the light shown upon us. And we don't ignore them, but we don't let them supersede the manifestation of the light that is within us. So we follow God, to follow God, you know, you say, well, okay, I don't need to do anything. I'm just going to let God be God. Yes. But hear me clearly. I said, you don't need to do what the Holy Spirit is doing. And that is transforming you into the likeness and image of God. So all may see the Father God in you as well as in the earth. So even though you are following him, it doesn't mean that you're not going to have trials and tribulation. It's not, it doesn't mean that earthly six that earthly success is not something that you want or desire. He will replace those desires that are temporal with desires that are everlasting. However, acting in accordance to the truth and the goodness removes the danger of being wedded to them, of allowing them to be your gods, allowing them to be your front and center where you, where you, seek after them and you go after them above all else. And it puts you into a precarious situation as Solomon reminds, reminds us that it makes you in a place that you don't even want to exist because you, you, you know the knowledge of God, you have the wisdom of God, and yet you have, you have acquired all of this stuff that you can't take care of. And it is now beginning to beat you over the head and you have to go up on a roof or you have to get into a vacant staircase. You have to run someplace because it's just overwhelming. It's just, it's just something that you don't want to be a part of anymore. So when someone's effort is fully entrusted to God and God's will, then God is in control. He is controlling and ordering your footsteps. And when they are committed to him, those works are less and less and less to cause angst and anxiety and a downfall. It, 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 if you read it in the simple Bible, it makes it very, very clear. Commit your works to the Lord and he will establish your way. Commit your plans. Commit your means. Commit everything that you got and devise a conscious, a conscious application of the principles of God and his word. Now, this is a big deal. And I say and emphasize a conscious application of the principles of God. If you are not spending time with God in his word and letting him reveal to you his plan so you can then know his plan and then when he executes it through you knowing you know his plan the world has a lot of plans the the world has a lot of things that you know like you know, when Moses went and you know Moses had his snake and then the king said oh I have my sorcerers they have their skate it's their 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 snakes and their snakes can do the same thing as your snakes so the world can do a lot of things they we call it magic that looks uh, it's a counterfeit of what God's true essence is but you need discernment Solomon warns us don't be deceived don't be self don't deceive yourself. 
by looking at the things of the world and thinking that they're the things of God. You have to know that you know consciously the application of his principles and his words because they are life and they are life in abundance. We have to acknowledge his sovereignty. We don't know all things. We want to know all things. We are we are people designed to 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 seek after knowledge. He says that you know his people perish for the lack of knowledge. But he was talking about the lack of knowledge was they didn't know how to use the knowledge that they had. So even if they sought after knowing, they still made mistakes because they didn't understand the functionality of the knowledge of God. So we will always, always need God. We will always, the now, the future, will always needs God, need God. We have to acknowledge his sovereignty. We have to seek his will in everything we do. We used to have um, uh, people and we still probably still have people in the church. They were so bent on getting this in their spirit. They would say, God, do I go brush my teeth now? God, do I go to the store? There are some common sense things, or at least we want to believe that there are some common sense things that God has taught us that we don't have to go to him every single time. But let's face it. Let's face it. If, if, if that little act, if we lost a sense of, or, or we lost our vision or any of that kind of um, functionality, we would be back at zero asking God for the very same thing that he had already given us. And that's not a bad thing. Sometimes it's hard because we feel stupid. We feel immature. We feel that we have to ask God for everything every time. And we do. And, and the answer is in some respects, not really in some respects, in all the respects, we should. We should because we can and we know that he will not withhold any good thing from us. Let's just look quickly. Well, I'll just, I'm not even going to go there. But you do all remember the story of David. And you remember how God granted David as, as being a great warrior. He was a smaller man in statute than his brother's but he had learned the essence of who he was through what God showed him he was. So David became king. He, he had a tumultuous road to getting to be king, but he became king. And in his kingdom, David knew God loved him, God, he was with him, and had delivered success upon success, made him king, had protected him. And then David got a little, as my mama would say, too big for his purchase. He decided that he was going to go out and fat, fight a battle. And he didn't do what he normally did. And he would, he would always ask God, am I to go? Am I to take these men? And are we to fight this battle? Is this the battle of the Lord? This time he decided because they were mighty and high that they would just go and fight. And it was devastating. It was devastating. God, David did not succeed. Not because God didn't want him to do, because he did things out of order. He, he failed to acknowledge that he needed to know the plan of God in order to win the battle. We need to know the plan of God and how to order our footsteps because we know his plan. If not, we, we, may, we may appear to have had success only to have misery that, that that success seems to turn on us and we have more trouble than we ever asked for. So we have to go to God even with the smallest things to succeed because he knows how things function. And when things go bad, we need to remember to trust in him. If we, if we go and he tells us to stay, and we see trouble all around us, we can't get into a posture of fear. 
We have to take those thoughts captive and, and destroy them because they are lies that are saying that God won't protect us. And he has always said he would never leave or see nor forsake us. And he always protects his children. So we have to take that mental processing that would sabotage us to thinking that God doesn't care or God can't handle it. Or we need to take over God's responsibility. We have to destroy those thoughts. They're so intreatable because when you're up against a wall and trouble seems to be hitting you from every which side, it's like, God, are you going to show up? Are you going to allow them to tor me, torture me and torment me? One more time, are you going to allow me to be humiliated and destroyed? And the answer is no. And those thoughts of telling us that are thoughts that are twisting our image of who we are in Christ Jesus, because none of those things can happen to us. When things go bad, we have to remember to trust in the Lord and seek his guidance and his blessings will flow. His blessings will flow. When they got to the river and it didn't look like it was going to open and Moses was up on the mountaintop and God told him to raise his hand and he raised his, his arms and he raised his arms and his arms felt weak. He sent he sent Aaron and, and, and another man alongside of him to hold up his arms because he intended, God was committed to his people not to let Egypt destroy his children. He was going to take them across and he was going to, to take them across on dry ground and he was going to drown their enemies. But they didn't know this. They had to lean not to their own understanding, but trust God. In Psalms 20, in, in Psalms 20, in Psalms 37, 5, we're going to see this in a greater measure. We're going to see the mouth of God give us revelation on what to do, when to do, how to do it. We're going to see Solomon's points in Proverbs 16, 3, to focus on the truth and not to focus on a lie. Even though our eye gates and our ears will have us troubled because we see things with our cardinal eyes. In prayer, we said, let's put on our Jesus glasses so we can see beyond the situation of the media, the situation of, of, of the wars. He said we would have those wars. He said we would have rumors of wars. He said there would be battles all around us, but he he would protect us. He would provide for us. He would instruct, it, instruct us to do not only for the salvation he was going to provide for us. We know he provided salvation for everyone who was around us, who was Hebrew or non-Hebrew. He saved them all because he's a God of all people. And we have to have to follow the instructions. We have to know that he knows how to succeed. And we have to use his process of, su of, su of success. We often think it's not working. Why am I struggling so long? Why is the essence of who I am taking so long to manifest itself? It's the kingdom of God being birthed in you. Yes, I said it. I've probably gone 20 minutes and not talked about the kingdom of God, but it is all about the kingdom of God coming now, each and every day through us in this earth. It will come upon, it will come a point in time where this earth as we know it will no longer exist and only the kingdom of God will exist, but it is not the time now, but it will happen in due season. I was reading this poem and this poem struck me in this teaching. And this poem, um, I don't know who the author was. I did, I did try to search out um, this poem, but it was about the choice of commit of our commitment to God, what we have to offer 
to God. This porn reflects our desire to be totally committed to God, yet we have nothing to offer to God. And this is what I believe was similar to the prayer that Jesus made in his full humanity in the garden. He was, he, he was there um, being sought after, knowing that they were going to search him out to hang him to a tree and and to make mockery and make an example of him because the rulers of this world were embarrassed or didn't want him messing with their way of living and he knew that these people were wicked and they were evil and he 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 takes a group of his um, disciples, his apostles, to go pray with him because he knew that he needed to hear the plan. He didn't know the plan. He knew what would happen when they caught him because he had seen them catch other people time and time again. And he knew what they would do to them, how they destroy. They would destroy him as they was a common practice to him. So he went off to the Garden of of, of Gethsemane and he he's crying out to the, to the Lord. And let me just read this prayer to you quickly. I have nothing to offer. There is only my life. I lay it before thy throne. Lord, please take my life, mold me and prepare me for the life you have for me. Because he knew it was more. Let me give all, give my all. Let me, let you always say what is to be done with it. Help me. Help me, Lord. Take me. Prepare me. Use me. We see this prayer of Jesus crying out so much that they they characterized it as him sweating so that his he, he bursted capillaries and blood was dripping down his face to get the essence of truth of who he really was and not what the picture of terror that was before him that he knew was going to happen to his flesh define him. And he came to that point that Jesus just wanted, wanted God to, 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 to be with him. And he said, Jesus, I want to obey you. I want to do what you want to do. And at the same time, he says, I want to give up. I'm human. Please don't make me go through this. And Jesus wanted to step away. We, we, we hear it in the scriptures. But yet he comes to this point, like in this poem, the revelation that he wanted to please the father more than he wanted his own way. So he submitted his, his fleshly traumatic trauma mindset that was telling him exactly what was going to happen to his flesh. And he surrendered that choice and submitted it to God. And he said to God, not my way, but your way, not my will, but your way. This was the height of Jesus humanity. And at the same time, he realized he was more than just a mere man. He was a spirit being that God was going to use to redeem the whole world. So he came to that place of surrendering. Use me, Lord God. Use this physical, temporal bones and flesh to do your will. For it will be sometimes a hard cry for us. Sometimes it'll be uh, just a frustration and, and devastation in us to want to not be committed to what the Lord has for us. For others, it will be based on emotions. And generally, emotions will change and they are not stable. And you will change. But if you can move beyond your emotions, like Jesus did in the Garden of Gethsemane, and surrender, knowing what would happen to your flesh, and allowing 
the compelling commitment of God, knowing that he will never leave you nor forsake you or allow anything to happen to you that is not going to profit you good and all those around you, but you allow yourself to make that submission and surrender to him, we see the results in Jesus. We need not be afraid, for we know that he has a purpose and we will surely succeed and reach our goal. The commitment of pursuing your goals once you surrender to God is God's commitment to you accomplishing your goals. We commit ourselves to our goals, our dreams. We set our emotion, a powerful force that propels us forward. That's what commitment is. That's why we set goals. We want to move forward. And even when it's not clear what the goal is, we want to move forward. We want the action to produce success. Commitment demands perverseverance. It demands discipline. It demands us being unwavering, not giving up and changing our minds. It demands our determination. And it faces, it causes us to face challenges in the midst of setbacks. Because if we give up, we've come this far, what would it profit us to give up now? Just as a good football player, uses these skills in the natural, we must understand our spiritual being is, is, is working in the same way. Our commitment is to the principles of God and how they work. It requires us to stay focused, to work hard, because, you know, faith without works are dead. It, it requires us to stay steadfast with our aspiration and even understand that the path that we are on is the path of Jesus and we will become that path for others, that this is beyond our narrow limitation of thinking how things work. This, how it works, is that the whole manifestation of the kingdom of God is being brought forth so, so rapidly that when it finally unfails, it will be like a twinkling in the, of an eye. And he says, those who are ready will be ready and those who are not, they would have missed it because it'll be that quick. So every day that we think that we're not being transformed and our dreams are not being realized and our aspirations and achievement are not being taken seriously, they are. They are. This is the faith in the action of knowing who God is in us. He knows who he is in us, but often we don't know who God is in us. We he will change our hopes into reality. The kingdom will come and his will be done in us as well as this earth transforming into the new Jerusalem, the new heaven. This choice can be very scary because we don't, we haven't seen it before. We've never really gone this way. We know about the Garden of Eden. We know about the promised land that they went in and then the promised land had many giants. Will it be like that, Lord? We quiz it, we queer it, but we don't know. That's why we have to commit our works to the Lord and we have to commit our way to the Lord. He may pick our goals in a way that fulfills the plan of his creation. We cannot do it on our own. We try, we try. And even those who seem in the natural to be so successful because they they seem to got, get all the natural things, they get the cars, they are able not to worry about money, they're able to buy planes, they're able to have mansions, they're able to, to live a, a high level of six, the world's successful life. Just like we saw the 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 Hebrew children when they when they left and they got got to Jerusalem 
and Judah, and they begin to live like the Egyptians. And God said, oh, no, 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 no. You're not getting it. You're not getting it. You have to live in me so I can show you. So these things won't pass away. And we know what happened to them. Their cardinal minds got them thrown into Egypt. They got, got, got them thrown exclusively not into Egypt, but into Babylon. God sent the Babylonians after them. We must commit. And commit is an action word. Commit it does require us to cease from doing it our way and allow the Holy Spirit. We just have to get out of the way. He's not asking us to do anything. We have to get out of the way. So true commitment requires us sacrificing ourselves, this nature, and being resilient to let the power of God work through us and coming into a deeper sense, a deep sense that our purpose is not for us just to get up every morning and drive a car or go to work or, or to hang out. It's Those things are fine and God doesn't prevent us from doing that. But our deeper purpose is so much greater than that. We do have a world to save and we are the answer to the salvation of this world because of the nature of the kingdom of God in us. True commitment, as I said, requires sacrifice, resilience, and a deep sense of purpose. God's commitment who is to himself. That's why we don't have to do anything. Just like, you know, the sacrifice when with, with, with Abraham, the same thing God did when he, he, when he brought forth the New Testament. He made the commitment to himself. And this is why this commitment can never fail because it's not made with flesh and blood. It's made God to God, and it will not fail. It will not falter. It will always succeed. God's commitment to himself, he honored his goal. His goal was to redeem all creation. He saved all the people in the wilderness. He took them out of the, impri the imprisonment that they had, the captivity that they were in. He took Babylon, the oppressed, the depressed nature out of them, even though he sent them there for a period of time to work out the world in them. He rescued them and, and he said, you're no longer called by their name. You're called by my name and oppression and depression is not a part of you. That's not who you are. And at the Jordan, when he, he allowed them to cross over, not one time, but two times through the river, he saved them from barren and dysfunctional land and made them a, 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 a fertile and a, a harvest, a prosperous land. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, God saved Jesus from the emotional straught of, of feeling abandoned and, and fearing what man could do to, to, could do to him. He taught Jesus to desire his will because everything Jesus wanted would be taken care of because they were God's desires too. He could not deny himself, even though Jesus had to go to the cross to fulfill the plan of God. At the cross, God redeemed us from our sin nature. We don't have, if we belong to Jesus, we don't have a sin nature anymore. And death doesn't hold us. Where is the grave? It cannot keep us because Jesus rose from the dead. And because we belong to him, Everybody has eternal life, but we have eternal life with God, the creator of life and of the universe. So the choices we make every day, we, we have to understand the relationship with God is, 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 is more than just here is God and here is us. It is God and God and God, and we're in the midst of it. Some of us, it seems imp an impossible situation. People don't respect the truth. People don't recognize the talent that God in us, and they don't even want to be saved. But God, 
wants them to be saved. And God wants us to be his vessel of righteousness. So he wants us to be committed to his plan. He wants us to deliver his plan. We are the answer to the world's problem. And then these times we must remember and embrace our commitment to God. He is our God and guiding light. He is the ultimate illuminated path. We become that illuminated light path and strength for others to walk in so they too may see the salvation of the Lord and know how he has reconciled them through the redemption of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. We have to commit wholeheartedly no matter what the world looks like right now. If we open an, uh, 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 a news I, I don't get newspapers anymore, but on my phone and on the TV and on the radio, et cetera, et cetera. I know the world is in trouble. But we are not because we are committed wholeheartedly in living with integrity and purpose and love and executing God's plan. It is clear David warns us that every demonic spirit, because he had to live through it, every demonic spirit will try to stop this work, but they cannot. They cannot. We have to remember that we have a deep sense of purpose, that we have a plan. We're not looking for a plan. We have a plan. And any plans that we have, we we submit them to God so it we see if it fits his plan because his plan is the only plan that will succeed. We will have to make sacrifices. Jesus had to sacrifice his body in order that we may be saved. We may not have to ever sacrifice our body, but we will on a daily basis make certain sacrifices not to be co-opted by the world. We will have to be resilient. We cannot be weaklings. We have to trust God. As we reflect on the power of commitment, let us remember true commitment requires these sacrifices, resilience in the deep sense of purpose. God's commitment to himself, that he honored his goal, that he would redeem us as he has and all creation. So all creation is redeemed. It's just waiting on the manifestation of us to alert them and to show them their redemption. All creation, everything is waiting on us, looking at us. And that's why we don't have to carry this burden. When they look at us, we just need to let God be manifested through us. He knows that we can't carry this weight. That's why he made the covenant and the commitment to it with himself. It is in these times we must embrace commitment as a guiding light and an illuminated path of righteousness that he has called us in the fulfilling of his purpose, of his plan, and his redemption. We commit wholeheartedly to living in integrity, and we stand in the position of Jesus Christ. We don't even stand in our own position because Jesus defeated the devil. So we stand in the position of Jesus Christ, and when we do that, the demons must flee because they have been defeated. We commit our ways to the Lord and we trust in him. We do not hold back. And you know, when I saw this scripture, it, 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 I meditated on it even further because in Psalms 37, five, it is actually a prayer and it's a prayer on, on God acting. It says, commit your ways to the Lord and who acts, who acts, trust in him and who will do the action? He will act, it says. He will act. May we surrender our plans and our desires and our cares, knowing that he holds our future in his hand and he cultivates the spirit of, of trust and, and resilience and love in us. So he will act through us and we resist the enemy and they must they must flee because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And the abundance of life is the only thing that we have living in us because of the Holy Spirit. 
Commitment is a relationship, understanding in Psalms 37, it is our relationship with God and he will not abandon us. He will never forsake us. He saved us. He, he, he set us apart as, of his own and he continues to promise to destroy those things that easily beset us and our enemies. Our relationship with one another and our commitment are formed as a bedrock in him because without him, there is no life. It doesn't matter what status we hold, marriage, friendship, family, community, without him, it cannot be made whole. God committed us and we should be committed to him. Love, he tells us not to hate. Meek, and don't be jealous. Be meek, edify, don't tear down. Stand up for what is right, even if it means standing by yourself. Preserve, do not faint. Persevere, do not faint. faint. Keep keeping on, keep moving in, in, in him because he's working through you. Suffering, unfortunately, is a part of this burden that we carry. It is a burden. So we are often told we have a cross to bear, and we do. We have the burden of carrying God's love, his meekness, his gentleness, his self-control, and standing up against injustice. He offers us everything that he has to weather the storm. Commitment fuels our love and it strengthens our bond, not with just him, but with each other. And it fosters a sense of security. If you know you're standing shoulder to shoulder, you are able to fight stronger because you have the strength of your brother and sister. In verse five, it says, it tells us we have to trust God's plan. It is a process. It says, wait upon the Lord and he will continue to renew our strength and trusting in this what could be a very difficult task because of the timing. We know not what hour he will end it, but he will end it. In other words, the only way we can act in all the ways that we know are good is that we desire and we commit to allow God to act through us. That's the only way. We can't do this on our own. We don't have, we have authority and we have a pow the power to stand in Christ Jesus. Outside of that, there is nothing. We have the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. We have the leading and guiding of Jesus Christ. We have the comfort and direction for our life of the Holy Spirit. He enables us to live that God-centered life that we so desire. Psalms 37 lets us be encouraged to commit the way, our ways to the Lord. For he knows how the earth and the universe was crea created. We have just began to live an unlimited life. He tells us, Jesus told us, that this was our path. We were seated in heavenly places, so that's outside of the limits of this earth. And at the same time, we are transforming this earth into his likeness, into the kingdom of God, where it will not have sickness and disease and, and killing and jealousy and destruction, but it's through us that it must come. So we must stand in those things. Let us cultivate the spirit of trust and reliance on God and let and may we resist the assurance that that and rest in the fact that he will do what is necessary and more abundantly than than we can think. Let us commit to taking those leaps of faith because the matter of faith and spirituality and commitment, Holds a specific, holds a special significance. Commitment is steadfast and devotion to our beliefs in God. And it's the dedication of living in accordance to our values and surrendering to a higher purpose.
I know we don't talk about often our higher purpose, but there is a higher purpose for us existing. And we often know it. It's like, God, it has to be more. Yes, there is a higher purpose. Commitment is faith in trusting in the divine plan, plan, seeking spiritual growth and walking the path of righteousness with humanity and grace, not being puffed up, not being deceived, not thinking you more than you, you ought to, but with grace and humility. It is a journey for us as well of self-discovery, who God is in us and how he enlightens our inner person to know that we are in his image. Do not, do not, do not think that you are not valuable, that you're not the essence of who he has called you to be. Do you this day know what you're committed to, who you're committed to? Is it the will of God in your life at any cost? Is that your commitment this day? I think we have to ponder those things. My core message for us today is still the same. What does it mean to commit your works? And how do you commit your ways? My closing prayer is from another poem that I wrote. Um, this poem is, is written by Tom Zark, who I've modified a bit with his with permission. And he's considered one of the um, poets that are well respected in, in, in the Christian community. And the closing prayer says, give us new purpose, reason in a spirit and remove our hearts of selfishness and stone. Grace grants us wisdom, willpower and love as by divine presence, we are never lost or alone. Commitment is a word preached by the Bible to describe God's commitment to transform us and save. Commitment empowers us to become better than we were, never to be Satan's victim or perpetrator or slave. Commitment does not promise us to be absent of struggles, only that the power of God's protection from above. We must submit to Jesus as our Lord and Savior. As decisions, actions, and thoughts are judged by love. My closing prayer has a closing song, and I like to play, play it for you, and then I'll answer questions. This song is about three minutes, so excuse me if I've gone a little long, but I think that you would enjoy this. This is the song that was created for the National Day of Prayer this year. A steady hand to guide you If it seems you've somehow lost your way If you feel there's no one you can turn to Just look to God and pray On your knees or standing at a crossroads His love can 